Hey guys, we had some big breaking news this morning with regard to Israel that we wanted to bring you a few actually major updates um, for you this morning. So first and foremost, the temporary truce is over. Put this up on the screen. Um, the truce has expired. Israel has resumed their assault. International mediators said that talks were continuing in the hopes of quickly reviving the truce. But as of now, you had Hamas blaming Israel for the collapse of the ceasefire, saying in a statement it had offered to release more hostages, including older people, but that Israel had made a, quote, prior decision to resume the criminal aggression. That is Hamas's side of the story. Israel says that Hamas violated the ceasefire agreement by firing on Israel and failing to release as many hostages as it had promised. Hamas released eight hostages on Thursday. That was two fewer than expected after releasing at least 94 since the truce began. And Sagar, you know, basically where we are at this point is the original agreement that enabled this temporary ceasefire had to do with women and children. Well, now at this point, most of the women and children have been released. So what Hamas is saying, and, you know, take it for what it's worth, is that they've been trying to expand that deal to include other categories of people. And Israel at this point has been relatively uninterested. Um, we've covered on our show, of course, comments from Netanyahu and also comments from Defense Minister Gallant about how they are very committed to going back to the war to even expanding the war and focusing on the south of the Strip. And in fact, this morning, we can also report, put this up on the screen, flagged by our own Ryan Grimm. They are leafleting in Khan Yunus. That is one of the cities in the southern part of the Gaza Strip where people had fled. And they are warning them that they need to evacuate Khan Yunus lest before this next bombing campaign begins. And we already also know this morning that some of those bombs have already begun dropping, and we've had reports of dozens of people already killed in renewed hostilities. Yeah, so uh, all of this fits basically what was telegraphed. Uh, but the big question is around how long this is going to go. And there's a big dueling uh, strategy between what the United States and really the Western allies of Israel want and then what Israel itself is planning on doing. So we can go and put this up there on the screen. Secretary of State. Anthony Blinken reportedly told the Israelis behind the scenes, he said, you have weeks, not months to prosecute this campaign. The Israelis are like, no, I, I, I really don't think so. And actually, Crystal, just breaking this morning from the Financial Times with a leak from the Tel Aviv, from Tel Aviv and the Israeli war cabinet says, quote, Israel plans for a long war, aims to kill the top three Hamas leaders. They say that the intensive ground strategy in Gaza will continue into early 2024. Obviously, that is one uh, where, you know, that could mean anything. That could mean January. It also could mean March or April, depending on which way that you want to look at it. The top three Hamas leaders inclusion in that actually includes people who are currently living in Doha. So uh, that'll be an interesting thing. But most importantly, is they are basically trying to do to or telegraphing that they want to do to Khan Yunus what they did in North Gaza, which puts them directly at odds with what the U.S. and growing calls uh, for limiting and, and changing Israeli tactics here in the U.S. They want to uh, do the exact same thing to envelop the city of Khan Yunus, cut it off from the south. So we will see multiple more ground incursions, most likely from a forward operating in uh, North Gaza. Gaza City could be a staging area and also the shared border. What they did previously to Gaza City is they cut it off from the south in terms of uh, fleeing uh, both fighters and civilians and then came in from the top and enveloped the entire thing while having airstrikes. Now, the airstrikes have already resumed. Um, it's difficult to pin down exactly where, but even some reported at the Rafa crossing like previously uh, that we had seen. And of course, you know, what we have to always think about are the two million or so people who remain inside of Gaza to were told and are being told now to flee. This effectively, while it was already one of the most densely populated places in the world, they are now fleeing the quote unquote evacuation zone in the south and trying to limit people. It's difficult to see without a map, but if you think about the first third is basically been occupied. Most of the civilian infrastructure has been destroyed. Now we're moving on to the second third and everybody's being trying or at least ideally compressed into this like a small, tiny area of the strip, which, you know, raises the question of where the hell they want to go. And and is, uh, I think, is going to significantly increase questions and pressure and high stakes uh, negotiations because I just also saw from the Wall Street Journal increasing calls from uh, Israeli leaders who are pressuring the U.S. officials. They're like, you guys need to take some of these Palestinians or you need to pressure the Arab states to accept them. And of course, you know, the uh, Palestinians themselves are, are very reluctant to take that deal simply because they don't think that they'll ever be able to come back. Um, this 
this goes to much more meta questions around all of this but the the i think we could say with pro probably good confidence that the truce is over at least in the form that we knew it if there is a temporary ceasefire it possibly could maybe a day or two something like that but the willingness of the israeli forces to uh restart the campaign it looks pretty ironclad and that is a rebuke i think of the biden administration who very publicly was like we don't want this to restart so it also shows you the limits of u.s diplomacy uh, well, especially when that diplomacy only comes with like, please listen to what we're saying and not the actual use of any of the cards that we could very easily play if we wanted to. And let me read a little bit of the specifics of what Tony Blinken reportedly told the Israeli war cabinet, because it shows you just how at odds um, the administration, at least what they're saying, is from the um, Israeli war cabinet, of course, led by Netanyahu. So uh, these report reported remarks were quoted in Hebrew. This is a translation by tw Channel 12 News, which is part of why it's like a English is a little bit choppy. Anyway, Blinken said, according to them, quote, you can't operate in southern Gaza in the way you did in the north. There are two million Palestinians there. You need to evacuate fewer people from their homes, be more accurate in the attacks, not hit UN facilities, and ensure there are enough protected areas for civilians. And if not, then don't attack where there is a civilian population. And he goes on to ask, what is your system of operation? He told them at one point in no uncertain words, you do not have months, you have weeks. Now, again, is U.S. influence going to be brought to bear to try to guarantee that result? Remains to be seen. We haven't seen any of that thus far. He also raised the question of the day after. All right. After you finish your bombing campaign and your ground invasion and all of this, what then? Of course, the Netanyahu government has floated all sorts of trial balloons, which we've discussed here, one of which seems to be their ideal solution of pushing everybody out as you're talking about Sagari. They're into, you know, neighboring Arab countries or some to the U.S. or exclusively into Egypt, but they won't actually commit to what their real goal is. And Blinken said, you don't want the Palestinian Authority on the day after. We understand that. That's what the, the solution the U.S. has been pushing. The best way to kill an idea is to bring a better idea. The other states in the region need to know what you are planning. So putting pressure there as well. But again, clearly, and I think with the restart of this bombing campaign, and, you know, which thus far seems to be uh, approached in exactly the same way that the northern bombing campaign occurs, they don't care what the U.S. says behind the scenes or leaks to the press, etc. There's no evidence that they care about our words and our secret displeasure with their actions. Um, to, you know, the point you were making, Sagar, you have so many people condensed now in this very small area that the possibility of even greater civilian death is very real, very real. There's a report that came out. I don't know if you had a chance to read it. It's from this um, 972 magazine. I may dig yes. into it more yeah, on Monday, it. talking about the way they have approached this war and how it's actually been different than some of the tactics that they've used previously, even within Gaza. And one of the major categories of targets that they've approached are so-called power targets. These are things like major buildings, high rise apartment buildings, where in previous wars, it's not that they would have put them off limits, but they would have at least tried to make sure that the civilians had left before they struck these targets. This time around, they made these power targets and individual residential homes their primary targets, not because this was the best way to degrade Hamas's capability, far from it. Some of these buildings have very limited um, relationship to Hamas whatsoever, but because they want to shock the population into putting pressure on Hamas. So those are the sort of tactics that Blinken is referring to here when he says you can't do in the South what you did in the North. The North is destroyed. Like there is nothing left to go back to. Effectively, all of the civilian life and infrastructure in the North has been gutted. So that's where we are right now today. And this comes also as there is a stunning report from the New York Times about we were debating whether you can even call it an intelligence failure at this point. Um, they knew, put this up on the screen, about the October 7th plans more than a year in advance. 
Um, Israeli officials obtained Hamas's battle plan, I'm reading now, for the October 7th terrorist attack a year before it happened. Documents, emails, and interviews show. But Israeli military and intelligence officials dismissed the plan as aspirational, considering it too difficult for Hamas to carry out. The translated document didn't set a date for the attack, but described a a methodical assault designed to overwhelm the fortifications around the Gaza Strip, take over Israeli cities and storm key military bases, including a division headquarters. They go on to say they followed this blueprint with shocking precision. You're talking about it called for a barrage of rockets to start, drones to knock out the security cameras, and automated machine guns along the border, gunmen to pour into Israel en masse in paragliders, on motorcycles, and on foot, all of which happened on October 7th. And not only that, so they've got this document laying out the plan. They also had an intelligence unit that was monitoring activities in Gaza Strip. And these analysts were saying, we're watching them prepare for these attacks. We see them training. We see what they're doing. They're serious about this. And those concerns by the higher ups from this, by the way, all female unit were completely dismissed in spite of the fact that they had this intelligence right in front of their face of what they were planning. It is truly astonishing that this was missed. Yeah, this is not an intelligence failure because it's clearly the intelligence work. This is a leadership failure through and through. There's no other way to describe it. It Also, there was a lot of talk uh, after 9-11, not only of the intelligence failure, but everyone was like, oh, it was a failure of imagination. I mean, here, it just seems to be that they just simply did not believe that Hamas was capable of a large-scale military operation, despite... 20, almost 20 years now of them warning that they have military capabilities, rockets, terrorists, they have all of these weapons. And this is why, you know, you have to just be deeply skeptical here, where the when they say, BB says we need a long war, well, the longer this thing goes on, the better off it is for him. The more he, farther away he can get up from October 7th, the less questions are going to be asked about what happened. He says, we'll talk about the failures the day after the war, but for now, we're going to continue to fight the war. And you can't help but think he's one of the least popular prime ministers now uh, in all of Israeli history. The coalition government behind him uh, that continues to support him is held on by a thread, largely by most of his furthest right elements, and he has a direct incentive. So this is, again, why I just think uh, if he truly cared about Israel, he would resign. There's just no question. You need a leader yeah. with actual confidence uh, to be for the Israeli public and also to negotiate in best faith for whenever you're sitting across the table from the U.S., from all of the Western allies. So, yeah, reading through it, it is just it's shocking because re- what's what's crazy is the plan was followed almost to a T. Right. The blueprint of where and how to attack, not just the paragliders, their area, where to go, what, what base to do, they wanted to overrun, what, how they're going to distract them with the rockets. They knew that they had been distracted already in the West Bank <laughs> by the extremist fac- factions of the Netanyahu right. coalition, all of it um, to a T. I mean, it's incredible reading these emails that this intelligence analyst was sending, trying her best to send up a warning. She said, I utterly refute that the scenario is imaginary. She wrote in one email, the Hamas training exercise, she said, fully matched the content of Jericho Wall, which is the name of this um, document that they were able to obtain. It is a plan designed to start a war, she added. It is not just a raid on a village. I mean, just as direct as she possibly can. And they just dismissed it. And I think it speaks to, you know, it speaks to a complete level of arrogance. Right, Netanyahu has this idea, oh, we control the height of the flames. Obviously not. Um, I think it speaks to a level of contempt for Palestinians of like, oh, they're not capable of anything approaching this. So, you know, which ties into the arrogance. Also, a level of overconfidence in their technology, their yep. technology, you know, their fancy wall with all their super top tech, super expensive um, with their remote control machine guns, etc., which we know from what unfolded on October 7th was mostly disabled by um, cheap off the shelf drone technology, Mm -hmm. you know, something that an ordinary citizen could easily purchase and acquire. Um, They were able to, you know, and this is part of why the response also failed for many hours. People were left on their own to fend for themselves when you have this, you know, ragtag bunch of terrorists versus one of the preeminent militaries in the entire world. So it is stunning 
to see this level of failure. And of course, many people are drawing comparisons to the intelligence failure we suffered before 9-11, where again, it wasn't that we didn't have the information. It's that people did, didn't do anything about it and didn't take it seriously. To be honest, Crystal, this is worse because uh, we knew been so the famous warning, I think it was uh, August 2001, bin Laden determined to strike the US. We knew that two of the hijackers were in the United States. The Saudis definitely knew it too. Probably helped him, but uh, that's just conjecture, I guess. Uh, we did not know about the World Trade Center. We didn't know about the Pentagon. Uh, it was a cell of only 19 people. That's another reason why this makes it even more stunning. You had almost 12, 1,500 people who participated in this attack. That's literally, what, a thousand times, yeah, a hundred times more than the number who participated in 9-11. So 9-11 is not even comparable in terms of the planning and the scale. They yeah. literally, it, it would be as if the CIA and the FBI literally knew they were like, ah, oh, they were going to hit the World Trade Center with two Boeing 737s. They're going to hijack multiple things. They are, they're going to use box cutters. These are their attacks. They're going to strike in the more. That's basically the level of precision that Israel had on this and they ignored it. So yeah. look, I don't think you can, and, and this is where the most normie critique of Netanyahu is just so obvious. There's two options. Either he ignored it and so did the Israeli leadership or his bullshit and cult of personality where he centered all Israeli politics around him, distracted the entire populace and top leadership away from what should have been focused on security. And in that vacuum, Hamas, perfect storm, they were able to pull off this attack. Yeah. So I, I think it's 10 times worse than 9-11. Well, and let's not failure. forget that, you know, Netanyahu's longtime plan in order to thwart a Palestinian state that he, you know, has stated multiple times is we need to bolster Hamas because then we can use them as an excuse for not being able to pursue a peace and keep the West Bank and the Gaza Strip separated with, again, this idea, uh, this arrogant idea that, oh, we'll control the height of the flames. And, you know, so I, I can control what's going on here. I'm Mr. Security. So uh, it really is, I mean, it really is quite stunning. It will also feed the conspiracy that this was effectively like a false flag, like they let oh, yeah. it happen intentionally, which I don't buy and I'll tell you why, but I, I'm curious your thoughts. Because sure. this is such a political disaster for Netanyahu. Yes, that's why I don't like, buy it. <laughs> he is ideological. There's no doubt about it, right? That he's very ideological person, but his number one ideology is to himself and his own grip on power. And you would have to be a complete fool, which I do not think that he is, to think this was going to be somehow good for you politically. So that's why I don't buy that. I think it's just sheer incompetence. But that doesn't mean that as many nefarious leaders do when a crisis hits, that they don't then try to use that crisis to effectuate whatever their personal, political, and ideo ideological goals are. And that's exactly what we're seeing unfold right now. Yeah, uh, agreed 100%. Okay, uh, we're going to have another update for you now on Gavin Newsom and the Ron DeSantis debate. Let's get to it. 